And so there are a lot of people that wants to, or a lot of um, uh, liberal scholars who want to translate this as uh, uh, when God created the heavens and the earth, or in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, in order to make it a dependent clause instead of an independent clause, therefore making Genesis 1 1 not the first act of creation, and therefore matter becomes co existence uh, or co eternal with God and pre existing creation. That um, that God created from pre-existing matter, like the pagan gods did, and that sort of thing, and they want to sit there and and try to argue that in order to argue for uh, um, deep time, uh, even before the first verse of the Bible. What? 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 Oh, hello. Hello, uh, welcome to Apologetics 101. I am your host, Christian apologist Brian Keith Bowen. All right, today uh, we are going to be starting a very big series that I've been promoting for a while now called the Genesis Series. Uh, in a few weeks, I actually have Dr. Jason Lau going to be on here with me to discuss um, the origin of the universe. That's going to be an interesting conversation. I haven't had Dr. Jason Lau on my uh, program for a while. And so it'll be interesting to have him on here. Um, this will be the very first uh, in the series. Let me explain the series real quick. It's going to be different from like what I did with the Genesis controversy and so forth. The Genesis controversy was more me trying to do something within something, you know, something within my normal channel of, of YouTube. This before I started to really incorporate uh, conversations about the Genesis Book of Genesis within my apologetic. Um, my apologetic uh, YouTube channel and so now I am um, uh, decided to do an, a full-blown actual series within my um, channel and and that's one difference but another difference is because it's going to be a commentator type series but it's also gonna be topological um, I'm gonna try to keep it in order as best as possible but what's gonna end up happening is I'll end up doing a commentary of certain passages and I'll go back and do various subjects that relate to that um, that that scripture passages and so forth like I do Genesis 1 today and I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna do various things I'm gonna talk about the origin of the universe and um, when we get to um, chapter 2 I might deal with some stuff about evolution and things like that and sometimes I'll invite somebody on here and sometimes it'll be done in the form of a presentation by me uh, sometimes it will just be a commentator you know me going through it and doing an exegetical analysis of the text and so forth it's mostly gonna be focused on the first 11 chapters of Genesis because that's what's really gets attacked by a lot of people including people within the church actually Surprisingly enough, you wouldn't think that people within Christianity would attack those passages, but they that they do, or that they don't consider it attacking it, but they 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 try to support certain secular views by trying to force it into the text when the text doesn't read that way, and so um, and a lot of times sometimes they will try to abuse the Hebrew or something of that nature, and so that's what um, what this series is going to be about. It's going to be you know responding to those kinds of arguments it's going to be presenting um uh evidence to the contrary and things like that we might deal a little bit with the existence of god and so forth um now um uh, today i'm going to start the series off i wanted to do a commentator a commentary type deal over genesis chapter one an in-depth exegetical commentary now that doesn't mean I won't come back on various subject matters I will because I do want to do a full-blown presentation against the dependency what's called the dependency clause translation of Genesis 1 1 um, and things like that and also we we'll got like I said in a few weeks I've got an interview scheduled with uh, dr. Jason Lyle on the origin of the universe it's also gonna be part of the same series and so we're gonna have all that kind of stuff on it as well and so um, I'm gonna try to keep it in order but like I said, it's uh, I'm gonna be doing commentary, and then I'll be going back, and then I might skip around a few times depending, because I have to sit there and um, uh, base, um, you know, if I have some people on there to interview, 
I'll have to be working around their schedules and things like that as well. Um, but this is going to be very interesting. It's going to be a very big series. I predict it's going to take me the rest of the year, possibly into the next year. Um, that doesn't mean I won't be doing other stuff. It just simply means that it's going to be a huge series. It's going to have lots of videos in it. Um, I expect a lot of stuff to come out of it, but it's going to be, it's going to be pretty massive. And, uh, today I decided to use something that I've never used on this channel before, Logos software. And in order to actually go over the text with you, go over the translation and, and show you the Hebrew and show you the meaning of words and things like that. I think that might be helpful to people who are watching this channel so I'm not just simply reading a Bible translation to you anybody can do that you can open a Bible translation and read it for yourself uh, the object of it however is that I'm going to be exegeting chapter 1 of Genesis and I'm going to be going in depth into the Hebrew and, and showing you where uh, how it's translated and stuff like that because sometimes there's abuse with the translation things like that like I said I'm going to go back and we'll have uh, more in-depth zero ends discussions about um, you know uh, the age theory and things like that that people try to come up with and and like I said a few weeks we'll have a discussion about the origin of the universe as well so this is going to be a very interesting series a very big series I really really am looking forward to this please watch each video in the series um, uh, and if you just jumped in the middle of it please watch uh, from the beginning if you can uh, because it's going to be pretty cool uh, and I'm going on all, all 11 chapters of the book of Genesis all right let's begin again welcome and um, I guess uh, let's start let's dive into our text here uh, we're going to be doing Genesis 1, as I already mentioned. Um, all right. The first uh, verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, this is something that, that almost every single person knows at this point, even laymen, even people that have never read the Bible before. Uh, before I became saved, before I became a Christian, um, I knew, you know, I didn't know anything else about the Bible, but I knew this passage in the Bible. Um However, in recent times, this, this verse has actually been challenged by people that profess Christianity. And uh, they want to render this as a dependent clause. If you don't know what a dependent clause is, it's basically any clause that is dependent upon other, um, uh, other clauses for its information that it has to have more to supplement its um like, for example, if I say, uh, when my son came back from school, and then as soon as I say when my son came back from school, or after my son came back from school, you're expecting me to finish off more information to it. That's called a dependent clause. And so there are a lot of people that want to, or a lot of um, uh, liberal scholars who want to translate this as uh, uh, when God created the heavens and the earth, or in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, in order to make it a dependent clause instead of an independent clause, therefore making Genesis 1 1 not the first act of creation, and therefore matter becomes co existence uh, or co eternal with God and pre existing creation that, um, that God created from pre existing matter, like the pagan gods did, and that sort of thing. And they want to sit there and and try to argue that in order to argue for uh, um, deep time uh, even before the first verse of the Bible. However, this uh, the dependent clause thesis is indefensible from the uh, uh, actual Hebrew grammar. They argue that they, they think that 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 um, this should be rendered as a dependent clause because it lacks a uh, definite article here for Bereshit. Okay, if you look at over here, let me. Um, Switch to my Hebrew here. Yep, right here. B Bereshith, um, translated here, you see that there's no definite article. In the Hebrew, the definite article would be uh, uh, the hey, which is um, uh, actually, uh, here's an example right here. Hashamahim has a definite article right here. But the hey, the patok, 
and the uh, um, uh, Shin, which uh, has a uh, Deus Forte in it, which doubles the constant sound. So, uh, and Shin makes sound, so it's Hashamahem, um, the heavens. And uh, here, though, there, it lacks a definite article. So they argue that if Boreshith is meant to have a, a definite article, uh, then it would have a a Quamats right here, a vowel pointer called Quamats, below the uh, bet. Um, and they argue this because a lot of uh, uh, construct chains where the construct noun has um, uh, no definite article in front of it. So they say, well, if it don't have no different article, then that puts it in construct, which puts it uh which puts it in construct to uh bra create here. Um and this is actually not the case because in temporal phrases, particularly when it came to uh relator nouns or relational nouns, uh they will often appear with no definite article and they do appear in the absolute state. Like, for example, Isaiah 46.10, for example, uh, is in the absolute state. Uh, if you don't know, Isaiah 46.10 says uh, that God knew the end from the beginning. And from the beginning is Moreshi, which is, um, uh, again, inseparable preposition in front of it. And plus uh, Reshif, Hebrew word for beginning, first, first fruits, chief, etc. Um, and it has no definite article. So I'm going to do a full-blown presentation of this uh, eventually. Also, another thing is bra. Bra, it, it, see, in all, in all the examples of construct chains, they always have an absolute noun, um, not just a construct noun. Um, but bra is not a noun at all. It's a verb. It's a finite verb. And so you can't put that as an absolute noun as a finite verb. So either you'd have to move, remove bra, or bra would have to occur at least in word order before uh, boreshis. So, um, and that's not the case. So, uh, I don't. It the the Pentecost translation is unnatural. It it sounds forced. I agree with um, uh, Dr. Jonathan Safrati and his uh, um, his um, commentator on Genesis uh, chapters 1 through 11 uh, when he uh, had said uh, that the uh, dependent clause translation is clearly artificial uh, and it is clearly artificial it is um, a, a forced translation it does not sound natural from the Hebrew um, the, the most natural reading from the grammar of Hebrew here is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth that's how you translate Bob all right so this is an absolute beginning point. Um, probably in, in, in a number of weeks, uh, I probably will be doing a full presentation in, within the series, a full presentation of the uh, of the uh, uh, defending the traditional translation over the uh, dependent clause translation. Of course, the people who hold this position are really trying to deny uh, creatia ex nihilo, uh, as they themselves usually end up admitting that this. Translations intended to deny that. All right. Um, moving forward. Okay, we got established that um, with the uh, the uh, Boreshith, Elohim, Bra, Et, Hasham, Maham, Ba'et, Ha, Retz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, that's that's the Hebrew. And that is the reading from that, and that's how you translate that. And then it says, and the earth was waste and void, or should be like uh, formless or empty. Um, the, this translation uses the word waste, which is another translation for, uh, for it. Um, I believe that's the, yeah, that's the Tohu. Um, but... Um, uh, the it's probably more accurately as empty uh empty and void and the idea is that, that there's nothing on it i mean god created the world god created the universe space but there's no matter there's no uh life there's you know no water no land i mean it, it essentially is a wasteland um and so god needs to feel that and so um and this right here uh 
you you can't tra you have to translate that as being understood as an, um being nothing there being empty in darkness it, it, they try to say it's chaos no and that wouldn't be the context anyhow and darkness was upon the face of the deep um okay another thing is here right here uh where you see the and here that's a vob i believe it's right here um it's a what's called a vob disjunctive it's added to the uh ha ha arets um at the uh beginning I'm, I will turn turn to my Hebrew Bible because it's it's kind of hard to to read this on the reverse interlinear. They kind of broke everything up. It's supposed to make it easier on a person who's speaking uh the who's doing English, um and don't know the Hebrew as well. But it's easier for me to explain this stuff if I'm actually seeing these these letters together. Okay, here is Vaharetz. Uh, and this is uh, and the uh, and the earth. Okay, uh, this is normally not the normal order of Hebrew. The normal order of Hebrew is what you see here with Bereshith, Bra, Elohim. You have the uh, noun first, then the verb, and then the uh, uh, um, subject, um, and you have that first subject that and then you have the definite or direct object you see this the direct object makers here and you have the um this direct object maker and that's uh so you have the heavens and earth is direct objects and you have that's the normal word order um here they put the uh noun first which they normally don't do um or the uh, um subject first you know the direct object first they, they don't normally do it in that order but the reason they did that is because they added what's called a valve disjunctive here. What the, this does is this combines this to this, but it makes it dependent upon uh, uh, verse 1. So verse 1 ain't dependent upon it. Verse or uh, uh, Whether verse 2 is dependent upon verse 1. Because it basically tells the state or condition of what, you know, after uh, following verse 1 as the first act of creation and so when we look at this uh this is a um uh a evolved disjunctive and this makes the gap theory linguistically untenable uh we'll probably cover the gap theory at some other point but i figured i might well point that out as we are doing exegetical analysis of genesis chapter one all right it was waste and void or empty and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters um all three aspect all three persons of the trinity were involved in creation the father son and holy spirit uh moved upon the face of the waters and god said let there be light and there was light this is the first introduction of uh light uh and the first time energy got presented in the universe and uh, a lot of people sometimes attack this and say the light source sun wasn't invented yet uh god doesn't actually need the sun to create light that's that's kind of a, um i don't know why people seem to think that that god somehow requires the sun to produce light he can actually produce light on his own um it is unclear what this light source was. Um, it could have been God. Some people have leaned toward the idea of being God because Book of Revelation, after God destroys the sun, it says that he himself, uh, it says that he doesn't need the, the, the sun for light because he himself is will be our light. And so the idea is that God himself is the light source. So some people think maybe God was the light source. That's usually why I lean toward but I'm not 100% sure because it doesn't really say in the text. We don't really know. Uh, it could have been a physical light source. It could be God calling light into existence and light existed without a source, which is possible because, I mean, this is a, a miraculous occurrence. It could be um, uh, God actually being the source of the light. That's possible, too. 
Um, but one thing is sure, we don't know what that source of light was, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't one, and it doesn't mean that God didn't produce it. God said there was light, and there was light, okay? He said, let there be light, and there was light, okay? And God saw the light, and it was good. This is the first reference to the word good. It will make the reference good several times before finally ending in a very good this is supposed to be a way of emphasizing the fact that God created everything perfect and good prior to sin. It was sin who tainted his creation. And God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Um, and it says, and there was evening and there was morning one day. All right. Um, some people think that that because the sun wasn't created on day four, that that would be impossible because uh, the first three days probably uh, couldn't have possibly be 24 hour periods of time because it didn't have the sun yet. But in order to have uh, uh, be a day, all you really need is two things. One is uh, um, a light source and two is a rotating planet. You don't have to have the sun to produce a day. They're, they're, People who think that don't really know that much about astronomy because uh, in space, uh, astronomers discover like planets revolving around quasars and things like that um, as a light source. And they're not a sun, but they are a light source. So all you would have to need is a light source and a rotating planet to produce a day. And this right here, this last part in this verse, uh, it defines what a day is. It says, and there was evening and there was morning one day. Okay, this is a uh, um, a uh, uh, a cardinal number, um, I believe. And um, uh, it, it uses both cardinal and ordinal numbers. But this basically defines what a day is. It sets the boundary of evening and morning. Okay. Um, this representing one 12 hour period. This represents another 12 hour period. And so he's breaking it in half um, evening and morning. And then it says that, that that's what defi uh, uh, defines a day. It's one day. Okay. That's the first day. All right. And he says, and God said, this is interesting because you got a series of Bob consecutive. It starts to appear uh, when he says, let there be light. And you got another one over here says and god said that is um me all right and god said you got that um yo mayor um uh and god said uh let there be light again of the here is um the law consecutive right the law consecutive Again, indicative of historical narrative. I will be doing probably a presentation on uh, historical narrative versus poetic narrative because Genesis 1 through 11 is indeed historical narrative. And one of the, uh, the qualities that makes this a uh, historical narrative, historical narrative also has, uh, at least in Hebrew historical narrative, uh, with the Bob, a series of Bob consecutives like that. And it says, And God said, Let there be permanent in the midst of the waters, let it defied waters uh, from the waters. Uh, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament uh, from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, some people suggest a a, a, a canopy theory. There's lots of uh, biblical and scientific problems with the canopy theory. I don't really hold to it, but there are people that do. Um, but I doubt if this really is referring to that. Um it could be referring to the atmosphere and clouds and things like that nature. And God called the firmament heaven. And there was evening and there was morning, a second day. Okay. Again, this also is showing that this is a 24 hour period of time. Look at the context evening and morning, bound by evening and morning, and the use of a number in reference to Yom. All right. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. 
uses the uh, Hebrew word uh, for appear, which is ara, uh, um, which is uh, the word that is used commonly for the word appear. And so that's not what's used in Genesis 1.16, in spite of what uh, he Ross and others want to believe. Uh, the word used in uh, Genesis 1.16 is uh, asa, which is actually synonymous with bra, great. This right here is a pure ra. Uh, you can look over here. It's right here. Te uh, ra. Uh, te ra. That's being used here. Uh, all right. All right, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, let the dry land appear. Uh, again, uh, te ra, uh, the actual lexical word is uh, ra. It basically is a word that means uh, um, um, to make what is invisible or at least not visible to the naked eye visible. Now, um, can look over here. And see, uh, Ra, right here, see, Ra, uh, see, under, uh, stands, spy, reveal, look at, examine, inspect, show, etc. All right. Okay, let the dry land appear, and it was so. Uh, what God's command is now so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of waters called he seas. And God saw it was good. Again, here's another good reference. Uh, again, it's a way of emphasizing the perfect creation prior to sin. And God said, let the earth put forth grass, herbs, yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind. Notice this after their kind. This appears several times as well as a way of, of identifying the fact that God is creating them. Uh, as dist distinct groups that are separate from other groups that God is creating. And each one of these groups are able to interbreed with members of their own groups, but they do not interbreed with members beyond their own group, okay? So this distinction is very important because this actually contradicts evolution and evolutionary theory, but we'll get into that later on down the road. Um, wherein is the seed thereof upon the earth, and it was so, and the earth brought forth grass, herbs, yielding seed after their kind. Again, you'll see that several times. And trees bearing fruit within the seed thereof after their kind. And God saw it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning a third day. All right, so we got on, on day three. And God said... Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day and the night and let the, them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for the lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to, uh, to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Okay, this is God creating the universe. He creates the sun. He creates the moon. He creates the stars. And notice this happens out of order from uh, what is claimed by the Big Bang Theory. The sun and moon are being created after God had already created the earth. And he had already filled it with life too. Or at least uh, as far as plant life. As far as plants, I mean, they're not live in the biblical sense, but he's already filled it with plants by the time you get to creation of the universe. So this is in contrary to what is claimed by the Big Bang Theory. Notice also that sun and moon are actually omitted. He calls them uh, two great lights. The greater light 
to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. This is intentional. This is an anti-polemic against pagan uh, beliefs at the time because much of the ancient world believed or worshipped the sun and the moon. The sun is a greater god, the moon is a lesser god. The Egyptian was famous culture that was uh that did this where they worship the sun and the moon and um they they refer to their sun god as Ra and the Jews came out of the Egyptian culture and so Moses is writing an anti-polemic against this type of uh cultural ideological worship of you know, the sun and the moon and he does this by showing that they are products of god's creation they are not deserving of worship they're not worthy of praise they are no different than me and you because they were created by god and, and in fact humans are actually uh god's crowning achievement so actually we are uh much more specialized than that the sun and moon were products of his creation they were not worthy of worship like that. And this also would be against the idea that that, that, that Moses somehow borrowed elements from these pagan uh, myths because uh, he indeed uh, omitted the sun and the moon in order to be a strong polemic against the idea of idol worshiping of these two uh, um, uh, created uh, objects. That they are just objects created by God and they do not uh, deserve our worship, worthiness of our praise or anything like that. He made the stars also, almost like an aftermath. He made the stars also. By the way, that's it. that's one of the things he also made, you know, no big deal. God has that kind of power. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule the day and the over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and morning the for a fourth day. So this is the fourth day. Um, and of course, we're going to deal with um, probably not too long, but we're going to probably deal with a uh, um, uh, so-called distant starlight problem. Um I got Dr. Jason Law already scheduled for a uh, discussion on the origin of the universe um, and, and discussing the problems wrong with the Big Bang Theory and stuff so forth. And so that's going to be uh, our next discussion. But I do want to schedule a um, discussion with him after that um, regarding the so-called just the starlight problem, particularly the uh, his ASC model, Anisotropic Synchrony Convention. Um where light actually could have gotten the same day because um, we don't know uh, what the speed, uh, the one-way speed of light is. And so the one-way speed of light could actually have been instantaneously. Um, and so it's likely that that, uh, that the speed of light or that the um, light could have traveled there in the exact same day, fulfilling, showing that they fulfill their God-ordained purpose to be uh, able to tell different signs and the seasons and things like that. And God said, again, and God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above earth in the open firmament of heaven. Um, and God created the great sea monsters um, the dinosaurs and all those creatures like Mesosaurus and things like that, they were all created by God. And every living creature that moveth, where uh, with the waters swarmed after their kind, again, after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Again, another good reference. Um, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, the, fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. We're now on day five, day five, five days of creation so far. So now we're up to the sixth day. And God said, again, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind and also this contradicts evolution where are these creatures coming from the earth the earth brought them forth 
Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. Um, and God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the uh, ground after its kind. Again, after its kind, after its kind, after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image. Okay, here's the uh, crowning point of, uh, of God's create, creative activity, the creation of human beings. And he made us in his own image, it says. In the image of God, he created he them. Male and female, he created them. Also, another thing is, list that says, and God, it says, uh, uh, let us make man in our image. Um, uh, that's a, a important triune statement there. Let us, it's actually plural. Okay, if we go here for a second. Let us make. Okay, let us make right here. Um, uh, not say, not say, uh, okay, not say. Um, so we got, uh, no, Nashe. All right, Nashe. Um, for this, let us make man, it's plural. Nashe. Um, uh, let us make man in our image. In our image, right here, new. Let us make man in our image. Um, and essentially, uh, it is a, a important trying passage. Who's God talking to here? All three, all three persons of the Trinity were involved in creation. So he says, and God created us in his own image. In the image of God, he created he them. Male and female created them them. In other words, he created us distinct. Uh, male and female were compatible with each other, but yet distinct in compatibility. Um, in that compatibility. Uh, and, uh, so the genders were distinct from one another. And God blessed them. And God said, Unto them, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now, in some places, uh, um, uh, subdue and dominion can have like um, uh, a violent type uh, context, and it's true that it can in certain contexts, but not in Genesis one. There is nothing in Genesis one or two that would indicate a violent context. In fact. Uh, this seems to suggest a subjection of authority that God gave them. It was a God-given authority that they did not have to force the authority that they had. Adam was given the right to name the animals, for example. And there's no evidence at all of any type of violence uh, being made. And so this would show that the context indicated this is not a forced type of authority over the fish and over the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves upon the earth and god said behold i have given you every herb yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for food in other words they were vegetarians initially uh notice that they, they were not ordered to eat meat at that time uh, this was before sin that came into the world. Death did not enter the world yet. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given you, uh, given every green herb for food. Again, they were created. They they were done as a vegetarian vegetation. You know, you they were um, ve originally vegetarians, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. This is following creation. Everything he made. And behold, it was very good. This is uh, supposed to be a, a strong emphasis here in the Hebrew. It's supposed to be a very strong emphasis. The idea isn't just that it is uh, good 
all of creation was very good. It's to emphasize the fact that this is prior to sin coming into the world and tainting all of creation. And God saw everything he made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now, this is the six days of creation. Only the six days of creation were uh, part of the uh, his acts of creation. The seventh day was not an act of creation because uh, it, it's actually a day following those six days of creation. But it's also the day in which God rested from his labors. And um, get, you get to that on uh, the beginning of chapter 2. I'll read part of here, this. And the heavens and the earth was finished, and, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work uh, that he had made and rested on the seventh day for all his works which he had made. God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because that, that in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The idea is that God created the seventh day and um, uh, or the God created all creation in six days and on the seventh day he rested and this is the type for uh, our work week. It uh, typifies our work week. And this is referenced in Exodus 20 verses 8 through 11, especially verse 11. And God rested from all his work. Some Old Earth creation, uh, old Earth creationists have a tendency to think that seven days is still continuing. This is based on a misinterpretation of uh, Hebrews chapter four, and I think a passage in Psalms as well. But the uh, object of it is that God's rest continues, not the day. The day didn't continue. I mean, if I rest it Friday and then rest it Saturday and Sunday, and then now it's Monday and I'm still resting, that would not mean that it's still Friday. It just means that I continue to rest. In fact, uh, Hebrews 4 is interesting because Hebrews 4 actually goes into detail about um, about the, uh, uh, the there were people that don't abide, you know, the unsaved, that don't abide uh, in God's rest. And that's what the context indicates, that the unsaved is not abiding uh, within God's rest. But if, the, if this is talking about a day continuing, certainly they were part of that same day. So that's obviously not what it's referring to. So the seventh day is not continuing. God's rest continues. He don't create anything else. Uh, Exodus 20 verse 11 makes it very clear that all that was created was created in those six literal days. All right. We're going to cover more specific topic matters as time goes on in reference to uh, Genesis chapter 1. We're going to probably be uh, dealing with several topics in that in that area before moving on to chapter 2 of Genesis uh, 1 through 11. All right, that's all for now. Um, I guess now I'm going to cue my closing. Thank you. Well, thank you for watching Apologetics 101. Um, and I appreciate it. And I uh, hope to see you in the next one. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel. And uh, drop me a comment below. Tell me what you think. Um, tell me if you'd like to see this series continue beyond the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Uh, let me know if you uh, come in contact with uh, other people like older creationists, theistic evolutionists, and... Uh, um, um, and evolutionist and eighth, you know, atheistic evolutionist and that sort of thing. Uh, and tell me what, what kind of arguments they presented to you. And um, we'll see if we can resolve them on this series. And uh, uh, let me know what you think in the comment section. And uh, this is Brian Bowen from Apologetics 101 signing off.